Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan. The YouTube algorithm guides say you're supposed to go for like 10 minutes, but I kind of want to like go into tangent control mode for a while on manga reviews and see if I can just do like some nice quick to the point reviews. So this is uh, Bokurano R's number one by Mohiro Kito. Kito. Uh, this first volume really like uh, surprised me, kind of hit me in the gut. And I'm not sure if I love it or hate it yet. Like if something's like, oh, that's so shocking. That's really cool. It's, it really grabs your attention. But I don't know what direction they're going yet. So, uh, but definitely great, great first whammy. So I guess the the premise of it would be kind of like how Neon Genesis Evangelion, the premise is, well, what if a kid piloted a giant robot, but he was legitimately scared of dying all the time and had post-traumatic stress all the time and got shell-shocked? Uh, Boku Rana R seems to be kind of like a send-up of the you know classic Japanese cartoon story where a whole bunch of kids in a junior high class pilot a giant robot, but then uh, actual death will occur. They'll have to kind of grapple with the guilt of there being collateral damage for what they do. Uh, so I'm really interested. And uh, the art style also uh, has gives me some neat things to talk about. So neat thing number one is that uh, Mohiro Kito actually can draw more than one uh, facial structure. So he gives you this just at the beginning, here's all the kids in the junior high class. You know, they each have a different kind of jaw. So I, I even like notice these two guys, they both have squarish jaws, but the, uh, Yosuke has a pointed chin and Dai, uh, Daiichi has a stronger chin but a low low mouth, so it's kind of like a squatter jaw. Uh, and like Takashi, who's kind of like the generic shonen protagonist type, he's got a little bit more of a plain, you know, face and kind of like an easy demeanor. It, it's great. So you can, it's not that hard to tell them apart. I did refer back to this a few times to keep their names straight. And then here's all the girls and similar things. So maybe like they all have kind of like a similar pretty face, but there's a variety in like foreheads, widths of eyes, eyebrow styles, ha hairstyles are helpful, and clothing styles all help kind of like separate them. And then there's one uh, little girl, Kana, so it's easy to separate her from the pack. So probably the most interesting thing about this is Mohiro's art style. So I'm just going to show you a few examples. He has what I'd call almost like a pencil sketchy style. It almost looks like he's taking his pencil sketches into Photoshop and darkening like really clean pencil work to get this sort of scratchy look all along the edges of everything. I'm not 100% sure, but he does have kind of like that. He likes to outline things with uh, multiple passes. And, you know, kind of like nice, clean, interesting uh, backdrops. They're, uh, he, I mean, he, he, he'll switch around a lot. So he'll have like the interesting backdrop with lots of little details and then lots of empty panels focusing on characters. And I think he does have a good feel for kind of expressive characters. You know, they, they look sad, they look happy, they look intense, they look regretful, and giant robots. So one of the things he does great is showing the giant robots and then showing like the little things in front of the giant robots so you get a feeling for the scale of it. And his robot designs are kind of insectoid-like, vaguely creepy, and kind of like a mashup of organic, you know, layers of armor. And they actually make a point that a really important part of fighting other robots is stripping through the layers of armor. So he actually designs them with la what looks like layer upon layer upon layer of armor. So uh, Coco Pelli, they meet Coco Pelli in a cave, and he says, well, I'm making a game. So if you kids sign this contract, you get to play this game where you're a giant robot. And they sign the contract, but it turns out it's not 100% clear, but it seems like the, what they actually did was they signed a real-life contract to kind of be the defenders of Earth, and they're not quite sure what that entails yet. I wanted to show off this robot design because it's kind of spidery and creepy and evil, and then a tiny little mountain, tiny little village in front of it to give it that sense of scale. So I really dig. I, I, well, I, an important part of giant robot manga is the giant robots, and then there's like a little cartoon dung beetle who's like their drill sergeant, and he's kind of a jerk. And I like that the fights make sense. So it's not just, oh no, the super laser didn't work. Let's use the super duper laser. Like it'll be, huh, well the laser's good if it uh, can get through their armor, but if they have layers of armor, then we gotta like attack it, strike it, peel back the armor, kind of like a praying mantis, and then get into the heart to kill them. So uh, once, once Coco Pelli disappears, there's like this creepy scenario where he seems regretful about signing them up for this task. Like he knows what he signed them up for. And all the kids are like talking about cartoons and manga. They clearly think this is going to just be a, you know, barrel laughs, little adventure for them. And then what becomes clear in each fight is the stakes are a lot higher than they think they are. And each chapter then becomes like a 
character study for one of the characters as it's their turn to pilot the robot. Now, I'm guessing the reason they're all on the robot is if one of them dies, another person has to take their place, but it's like they haven't like put two and two together on some of that yet. Like the whole thing with the chairs, like the chairs seem to indicate that there were people before them with Coco Pelli, and that's one of the reasons he's sad and alone is he's he was the last fighter left. That's my guess. So uh, I guess potential spoilers based on my conjecture, but uh so Takashi Waku, his story is kind of about coming to terms with who he is, and he was a soccer star, but should he play stock soccer just because he thinks he can be a soccer star? Does he actually like soccer, or is he just happy for attention? And so his story is kind of like coming to terms with who he is and figuring out who he is, and then that his being a soccer player actually helps him in a cool, a cool fight. And I really like this whole bit where they see the chairs again, but this time the chairs are different, and they realize that each of them is a projection of their own minds and what they what they want to sit on kind of the, the chair says something about their their personality so one of them's got like a throne and one of them's got like a little seat that goes in the ground one girl's going to have a baby brother soon so she thinks of a baby crib and it, it, I, I i like when they can like roast each other make fun of each other and they sort of like call attention to how you know different they are but this is narratively this is what makes it start getting really creepy because you realize oh shoot so what did the empty chairs mean before uh, how did I mark this? Okay, this robot designed kind of like a like a leaf bug, and, and what's neat about it is because of that like high, th like they don't like de over detail everything to death, but I kind of like think that the reasons the lasers reflect refracted off this is because it's so such a sheer surface, it's almost like hitting a mirror. Uh, uh, I won't spoil like the main thing that happens, but they kind of they quickly come to terms with the fact that. Uh, just because they get a pilot, a giant robot, doesn't uh, mean that they can't be responsible for, for, for death. So there's a death. I'm not going to tell you who, who it is or what, it's, what, what it entails. But uh, a, a, as they kind of cope with that, then it becomes a new person's turn to pilot the robot each time. And Masaru Kodaka, uh, he's a bit of a creeper kid like his his whole character arc is he has a dad who's kind of a donald trump figure who's like an alpha male who will like abuse his staff and uh masaru's older brothers hate their dad but masaru admires his dad and he kind of has an almost darwinian attitude that i want to be on top of the uh food chain and so when he gets a chance to pilot like he kind of recognizes look there's going to be collateral damage people are going to get crushed in the city underneath us i've got to focus on actually taking care of that giant robot. And there's this really, really creepy thing where he's thinking about how uh, he, he shot cats with a BB gun before, and he looks at uh, Bad bad Brother. What's this kid's name? Jun, Juno Shiro. So Juno Shiro is kind of like this creepy glasses kid. He's the older brother of Kana Oshiro. And Jun apparently loses his temper and he slaps his sister before before they stop him. And uh, Masaru's, what Masaru takes away from this is that uh, this kid actually has kind of like the cruel, cold demeanor that he wants to have to be able to kill robots. So, woo, it's really, uh, really hitting some like creepy, uh, like serial killers kid kind, kind of, uh, but buttons with this. So what quickly becomes clear is this isn't like a happy dappy, uh, Saturday morning cartoon giant robot story. This is a cast of kids each with kind of like different perspectives and real, some real problems and some mental problems too. And uh, like this doesn't like, like this is kind of like a bit of a on, on the nose way of saying like the kids bullying and abusive. But what I think this is doing narratively is this is saying each of these kids have like significant problems they've got to work through. And some of them it's just like, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up? Some of them, uh, they're trying to work through their relationship with their dad. I, I don't know what this kid's deal is yet, but I'm sure we'll, we're going to get some more development. But there's always like a nice poignant twist at the end, which kind of wraps it up with a nice bow. And uh, every every fight is interesting. So what was interesting about this robot, it's kind of got like this egg-like body and it can fire vines and throw them around, which is dangerous because now they're in a city, right? And there's going to be a lot of collateral damage. Uh, I was just really interested in it. So I, like when I was first reading it, I was vaguely creeped out. And then I thought, okay, we're going to have some kids piling a giant robot. And then like the death, uh, the death and destruction started happening. And I'm still not even sure if it's real or if they're in some kind of virtual reality world. So, ooh, boy, uh, really, really touching on some like, uh, I don't think it's grim dark like grim dark edge lordy stuff is when it's just shocking and uh depraved for the sake of being shocking and depraved. I think they handled the dark subject matter 
tastefully and well, just kind of indicating that some of these kids have problems, indicating that death is occurring, but not like shoving it in your face. And I'm really, really interested to see what he, uh, Mohiro Kito does. So style, I'm interested in it. I always like seeing unique styles that don't quite look like anything I've seen before. Uh, Mohiro does do a lot of, you know, beautiful detail work in the backgrounds. Uh, I feel like maybe this is kind of like, like Mohiro Kito is developing a sketchy style and he's still kind of working out the kinks on some of it, but uh, I, re I really got into it. He has an understanding of the human face and human expression that kind of gets you invested in the characters and does some, you know, fun little comedy, you know, junior high kids roasting each other bits and creepy, ro that's it, creepy robots, creepy story. It's a good fit of the physical action side to the kind of human drama side of it. And I'm gonna read more. With that, I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. If you like this video, like, comment, subscribe, click the bell to receive notifications. Check out my Subscribestar, the best way to support this channel. I love all my subscribers on Subscribestar, and I will catch you later.